Good evening. Special coverage right now. The state of the city address from Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan. And he is walking to the podium right now as we speak, <laughs> hugging people. And he is about to start. So let's listen to the mayor. Nobody's going to be there. So uh, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, Jason Lee and Focus Hope uh, for hosting us here tonight. And thank Focus Hope for their nearly 50 years of service uh, to our community. Uh, and I want to start with a, a special word to Janice Winfrey, who I wasn't expecting uh, to see here tonight. She woke me with a, a phone call early yesterday after uh, yesterday morning with the really devastating news uh, that she just lost her father, who she was very close to. Uh, and she said she didn't know if she could be here uh, tonight. And I was surprised to see her. And Janice, I want you to know uh, we're really glad you're here. And I thought some prayers are with you and your family. God bless you. Uh, and I want to thank my partners on Detroit City Council. It's interesting, when I uh, talk to my, my fellow mayors and we talk about State of the City uh, speeches, they're all uh, curious about why I have city council members on the stage. Apparently, that's uh, unheard of in other parts of the country. But I tell them, uh, here in Detroit, uh, we're rebuilding the city as a team. It's the mayor and the council together. Uh, and our goal is to rebuild Detroit in a way that includes everybody. It means all of our talents, the mayor and the council, have to be included uh, in those plans. And at this point, I'd like to introduce my partner, starting with our great council president, Brenda Jones. <laughs> council member Janae Ayers. <laughs> council member James Tate. I think you've got a bigger cheering section. Uh, council member uh, Andre Spivey. <laughs> council member George Cushingberry. <laughs> council member Mary Sheffield. <laughs> council member Raquel Castaneda Lopez. <laughs> uh, council member Gabe Leland. <laughs> and our clerk Janice Winfrey. And Scott Benson is out of town uh, or would be here uh, tonight. Um, but because of our partnership, uh, there's a great deal more hope in the city of Detroit than there was uh, when I delivered the first uh, State of the City three years ago. Remember how things were uh, back then? After 12 straight years of deficits, the city was finally in bankruptcy, and our retirees were rightfully afraid they were going to lose a significant part of their hard-earned pensions. Many of the police precincts had been closed uh, and, and consolidated, and a number of the ones that were open, uh, they weren't open after 5 o'clock, uh, and often took a half hour if you called uh, 911. Many nights there were only eight working ambulances in this town, and you didn't know when medical help would arrive. Overgrown grass covered not only the vacant lots, but the parks in the city that had all been closed that previous summer, and nearly half the street lights in the city were out, and nearly half the buses were sitting broken down in the garages. And those first few weeks, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I turned on the TV one night, and there was a reporter on TV asking people to please come to the local firehouse and donate toilet paper because the city of Detroit couldn't figure out how to get toilet paper to their firefighters. And I thought, how dysfunctional do you have to be not to be able to get toilet paper to firehouses? When Kevin Orr uh, departed and we left bankruptcy in December of 2014, a lot of people predicted Detroit would be right back in the same financial problems, that we couldn't manage our own affairs. But instead, we finished 2015 with the first balanced budget in 12 years. And then last year, we finished with the second balanced budget. And this June, we're going to finish with the third yeah. balanced budget. And I fully expect in early 2018, we will be permanently out from financial review, con uh, review commission oversight because we will have made budget and paid our bills for three years in a row. Self-determination will be back. Yeah. 
and we balance that budget while cutting emergency response time on police and, and EMS in half by getting the 65,000 street lights on while reopening all 270 parks while demolishing 11,000 vacant buildings and getting another 5,000 occupied. And with the help of the great DDOT drivers and mechanics and office staff, we're not only achieving full pullout, we're providing 1,300 more trips a week to the people of this community. So we know we've got a long way to go, uh, but I want to take a minute uh, to introduce the cabinet uh, who's been working on this. Most of the year, all they hear from me is why they're not doing more. And so this is the one uh, night of the year they get some recognition. If you see somebody, please tweet them. They really enjoy that. Uh, let's start with our great uh, chief of police, James Craig. I'm going to ask you to hold uh, your applause to the end, or my speech will be over when we're done. Uh, Alexis Wiley, our chief of staff. Dave Masseron, the deputy chief of staff. Uh, John Hill, our chief financial officer. Beth Niblock, our chief technology officer. Uh, Butch Hollowell, our corporation counsel. Charlie Beckham, the head of the Department of Neighborhoods. Eric Jones, our fire commissioner. Dave Minardo, the head of operations. Uh, we have Dan Dirks, who's running DDOT. Uh, and we have, uh, you're sitting in the wrong order here on me. Uh, Denise Starr, uh, I, I knew that, I shouldn't look at my page. Head of HR, Gary Brown, the head of the Water Department. Portia Roberson, our Civil Rights Director. Uh, Lisa Howes, our Government Affairs Director. Jed Halbert, who runs the Economic Development Operation. Arthur uh, Jemison, uh, our Housing Director. And our newest cabinet member, uh, Joan A., please stand up. This is her first week on the job. Uh, Joan A. Caldoun, our health director, <laughs> whose family is from Detroit, uh, but she went out to Penn for medical school, was working in the city of Baltimore as a nationally renowned uh, leader of the health department, and has come back here home and is now leading the health department of the city of Detroit. Please give a big hand to the entire cabinet. Uh, and I also want to take this time to thank the 9,000 men and women who work for the city of Detroit. Aren't they doing a remarkable job? Um, so that uh, pretty well gets us to the conclusion of the discussion of the things we've already done. Uh, because uh, I don't really want to talk about what we've done. I want to spend uh, the rest of the night talking about what comes next. Uh, we've improved the basic services, but if we're going to fulfill a vision of building a Detroit that includes everybody, we've got to do a whole lot more. And so I hope uh, the staff will forgive that we won't spend a lot of time on the past, but instead talk about the things that we're going to do. We're going to spend tonight talking about what comes next. And you can't have a recovery that includes everyone if there aren't jobs available for everyone willing to work. And the unemployment rate in Detroit has gone down from 18% three years ago to 9.8% last month, which sounds like a great accomplishment. Except at 9.8%, it still remains the highest unemployment rate of any city in the state of Michigan. We have a whole lot more work left to do. And so as our next step, starting tomorrow, we're attacking the problem by creating a whole new platform, which we're calling Detroit at Work. The Detroit at Work website is live now on the city's webpage, and it links you to training programs. But here's what's different about what's happened in the past. This time, we went to the employers in this city. And we said to them, what jobs are you hiring for? Tell us where the vacancies are right now. And then we went to the training programs that were training for those jobs so people knew if I actually went through this program, there'll be a job for me at the end of the line. Uh, and that's all we're going to do is put in training programs. We know there's a job. And it's, it's interesting in this world how you, you hit on these ideas. It came out of a training program. Uh, we started at the Ryan uh, Correctional Center for Returning Citizens, something 
uh, Council Member Janae Ayers uh, was a sponsor of. Uh, and what we are doing is taking uh, returning citizens six months away from being released. And we have about 3,000 people a year released uh, from the prisons of the state of Michigan come back to the streets of Detroit. And if we don't have something productive for them to do, we know they're going to get right back up to what they were doing before. So we got together with the state of Michigan and said, let's identify people six months before they're getting out. And we're only going to train them for jobs that we know exist. And so we talked to our employers, high-low operators in warehouses. You get a certificate to be a high-low operator, they can't fill them. Uh, lead abatement uh, specialists uh, that take out the lead to renovate the houses so we can rent them out in the city. You need special training, you get a certificate. Um, food and line prep cooks uh, for all the restaurants that are opening the city also. I didn't know this, but you get a certificate for that. Uh, and asbestos removal prior to demolition is also a job with a certificate. So uh, what we did was we set up training programs and we went uh, to, to the folks in, these, in the prison and said, here's four choices. And you can get good jobs, 14, 16, 18 dollars an hour if you want to work hard. And the response was remarkable. And so we did an event at Ryan Prison uh, where we announced this. And there was a young man who stood up at this and he was all excited. He says, I'm 25 years old. He says, and the first job training I've ever gotten in my life was here at prison. He says, now, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody else. <laughs> he says, but it does seem odd that you have to go to prison to learn your skills. And so I talked to him afterwards. And I said, this is interesting. Why, why couldn't you have gotten into a program before? And he said, you know, you got all these schools out there advertising. You got all these programs out there. You don't know if there's a job or not. He says, but what you did here was you came to us and said, here are the jobs they're hiring for, here's the training program, and we're excited to sign up. He said, if you ever did that for everybody else in the city, uh, it would be very successful. And so, uh, based on the advice of that returning citizen, we have today kicked off Detroit at Work uh, on the city website, and it's going to be uh, the portal by which people in the city get a clear path to jobs. So uh, Jeff uh, Donofrio, who's doing a great job running this program, is sitting down with the different employees, and they're now all on this workforce board, the Detroit at Work Board, and the hospitals come in, the, the heads of DMC and Henry Ford and St. John's. We said, okay, what have you got? And they said, we have all kinds of entry-level jobs that we can't fill, whether they're patient care assistants or people who work in the cafeteria, people push uh, folks in the wheelchairs. They said, well, how can you not fill jobs uh, in this city where we got such high unemployment? And they said, the biggest problem is we can't get transcripts, high school transcripts from the Detroit public schools. You can't hire somebody under a hospital if you don't have the transcript. And Jeff says, that can't possibly be true. And so they went over to the Detroit public schools. And you know what they found? One million paper transcripts in a warehouse, in a school system run by an emergency manager, who was 